It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome to the program. It is the dog days of summer. It's August. Wherever you are, I hope that you are listening to us via some great method of accessing us, perhaps the terrestrial radio. How about that? Maybe you're listening to us as you drive to the beach or to the mountains or to the lake. I'm not a huge fan of lakes, Mark. You you like right lakes? Uh, I think this has a an old connotation for me, which is that I don't love mushy bottoms. And uh, some lakes have very mushy, yucky bottoms. I'm more of an ocean gal. Or saltwater bay gal. That's me. Anyway, so, uh, you know, I I do love the ocean, but uh, I don't think there's any ocean in Colorado. And that is where John is calling from. Hello, John. Welcome to Jill on Money. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. What can I do for you, sir? Well, you know, I got a, I'm actually retired. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. And I'm at 59 years old. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I want to run all this by you. My wife's 48. I have a son that's 37. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. This is not your first wife. No, right. Yeah, Yeah, you did that before. Thanks, man. I'm good like that. Uh, (laughs) Is your wife wife working? No, she actually has been watching our three grand boys for seven years. Okay, my gosh. So, yeah. um, and you, so you have a son. You said is thirty-seven, yeah. right? Yep. And and is that it for kids? I have a daughter that's thirty-three. Uh huh. Then I have five grand grandkids. Wow. They're three, six, eight, thirteen, and sixteen. Three, six, eight, thirteen. Yeah. So they're and all kind of in my equation of my financial life here. So I'm a little, I don't know, maybe a little frustrated. I have. Five point three million. Wow, that's awesome! Congratulations, yeah, man. Yeah, good yeah, for I'm you. Actually, yeah, I'm in pretty good shape there. So I do have a financial advisor, mm-hmm. and he has me in buckets. Okay, the bucket right, theory but, being that you have certain money that is short-term money, certain money that is intermediate, certain money that's long-term, mm-hmm. and just even explaining this for everybody else, you know, because I know you know this. And maybe even like a bucket for like the vacation fund. So you got the buckets. And how's that working for you? You like it? Well, it's early. So I've only been retired like while well, he's had my money basically for eight months. Okay. So, Let me ask you a quick question. On the eight, yeah. $5.3 million, um, is that all liquid or does that include any of other assets like uh, a house or a rental property? Uh, no, it's just all retirement money okay got it and it's all in retirement accounts or is it non-qualified also Uh, it's all in retirement accounts basically index funds mutual funds a couple bonds there okay so i basically have it in four buckets so Mm -hmm. i have one in a higher risk Mm -hmm. and i consider that my grandkids bucket yep and then i have a moderate to risk that's my children's bucket Mm mm-hmm Got it. And, and then I have two other ones that are moderate and one is conservative. Okay. And uh, when, so is, is it split, is the split of the $5.3 million equal among those four buckets? It, it, it actually goes, uh, the risk is uh, 1.5. Mm-hmm. Then we got a 1.3 mm-hmm. for the kids. Mm-hmm. Then we have a 1.1 1. 1 and then a and then 1. Okay. So, How much money do you guys need uh, to live on? Well, I figure we got uh, probably about seventy five thousand a year. Mm-hmm. It's basically probably work. Okay, that looks good. So, That's a beautiful uh, thing. Okay, so actually it worked out pretty good. But then when we got down to the nitty gritty, he started asking me to put some money called the safe money. Mm-hmm. So he wanted me to take out. He said anywhere from two to ten years mm-hmm. of safe money. Mm-hmm. So I elected to do three years, but he wanted me to do a annuity, mm-hmm. and I said, "No, I don't want to do that." Mm-hmm. And what do you so, think? Why are you thinking that? <laughs> well, I've, I've, between you and Dave Ramsey and people I've listened to, nobody really likes annuities. Yeah, I mean, uh, look, it's I, it's tough to pick an annuity in this interest rate environment, mm-hmm. and 
it also occurs to me that, I mean, look, in a weird way, I almost feel like you're tilted the wrong way. I feel oh. like, just from what you're telling me, I feel like it's okay to be high risk, but I would, like, flip things around. I would have it a million in high risk, you know, like I would I would put less money away for the grandkids and the kids right now. Okay. And I would shift more of it to you guys because okay. essentially, let's just be, let's like make it dumb math because I'm dumb and I like to, you know, make it easy for us. Okay. If I, if I said, if I had three million bucks that was just generating money for you, I could basically, you know, say, okay, that's 90 grand a year. I got to pay some taxes. That'll probably give you about your 75 grand that you need. Maybe, maybe you need to take a hundred grand out. But mm. I, I think that if we had 3 million on which you were drawing, you wouldn't be, I, I don't love the idea of you losing the liquidity by putting it into a fixed annuity. But mm. I think that having the money come out for you, if you're wrong, let's say you're wrong. You're like, ah, I didn't even spend 75 grand a year. Or let's say that by the time you go and claim your social security, you don't need the 75 grand a year. The worst case scenario is that, eh, you know what? You were wrong. You'll leave, you'll leave the money to them later. So I, I, I think you'd be better off being a little bit more front loaded, keeping like the corpus of the savings in for you guys so, you know, three million for you, maybe two point three for them. And you could always make a different decision if you find like ten years from now you're like, Oh my god, I didn't even use all this money. I can push more towards the kids. Now do me a favor, we're gonna hang on for one second because I wanna ask you a little bit about the grandkids' funds and some ideas that I might have for that. So just hang on because we're gonna go pay some bills. We'll come right back. And we'll talk more. I love having the problem of how shall I allocate five million bucks? That's about the best problem to have. Um, and if you are in this situation and you're listening and you're like, oh, my God, Jill, I don't have five million dollars. I know you don't have five million dollars, but whatever you have is all the money you have. So if we just take a zero off and we say you don't have five million, you have 500 grand. OK, no problem. It's still all of your money. And somebody is going to tell you or advise you, oh, we could do buckets or, oh, we could do a an annuity. And if that is something that has come your way and you have a question about it, give us a call. So easy. You know, send us an email. Don't call us. At, so it's very easy, right? Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. And when we return, we're going to talk more about what John should do to help take care of these kids and the grandkids, and more importantly, how he and his wife are going to navigate the next 30, 40 years. Okay, we'll be right back. Follow Jill on Twitter and Instagram for more personal finance content. Just use the handle at Jill on Money. Now, back to the show. You're back with Jill on Money. If you've got a question about something going on percolating in your financial life, why don't you give us a holler? You can just send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Very easy. That's what John did. He's calling from Colorado. He's 59 years old. He's retired now for eight months. He's got 5.3 million bucks liquid. Fantastic. And he's working with somebody, a financial dude, who uh, put him in this something called buckets. Um, and the buckets are uh, high risk, which John thinks is basically for his grandkids, moderate risk for his children who were in their 30s, and then a moderate risk a uh, million, 1.1 for, for him and his wife, and then a conservative million bucks. 
And so I just I just asked if he would might consider flipping that around, making sure that he had more like three million for him for for his needs, for his retirement needs. And uh, and then maybe the rest of the money for the kids and the grandkids. So can I get you on board to, you know, basically shaft your grandkids and your kids for a little while? Is that are you OK with that? Sure, I'm sure my wife would like that. Fantastic. Also, I was just going to say she is young, so yeah. you know we're lock, we're talking about many many years in the future. I'm wondering for for you how so is the money that you want to put away for the grandkids or for the kids? Do you want to make that money basically pass at your death, or do you want to start gifting from these accounts? I actually wouldn't mind gifting it, maybe mm-hmm. like ten. 10 years down the road, 12 mm-hmm. years down the road. Okay, yeah. And uh, ha- tell me about the financial wherewithal of your both your son and your daughter. Are they are they in good shape, generally speaking, or do they need I, – I guess I'm wondering, do yeah. they need equal help, or do they yeah. one need more than the other? Actually, they're probably about equal. They're in fine shape. Great. Yeah. Okay, so there's yeah. nothing horrible happening here. No, no okay. not at all. Okay, great. And uh, did you also do some estate planning? Have you done that already? I haven't really done that. I, you know, I do have a, a trust mm-hmm. type. I haven't really got into the state thing yet. No. Yeah, I would do that. I mean, okay. listen, most of your money, if you're, it's if it's in retirement accounts in it, and they're qualified accounts, mm-hmm. it's a little bit out of your hands. Like the money's there that passes by contract, but you do have a bunch of moolah, and you're going to start taking it out. And I presume you've got some uh, some real estate. What you you have a primary residence. I do, yeah. How much is that worth? Uh, about three fifty. Okay, very good. Um, all right, I'm going to tell you this. I think that um, for for today, I agree with you that you're so young. I'd hate for you to throw money into an annuity. I understand what the guy is saying. Hey, you'll want this this very predictable stream of income. But it doesn't sound to me like you actually need that. I mean, you could essentially create your own annuity for a fraction of the cost just by having this very conservative outlook for three million bucks or so that's generating the money you need to live on. So I th- I really think that there's actually no need to have the annuity. And by the way, interest rates are rising, right? We're in a rising interest rate environment. I'm not sure I'd want to pop the, all that money in the annuity. How much money did he want to do? Like a million? Well, he he said two to ten years. So he eventually we agreed on like three years. So he has like three hundred and sixty thousand. Then 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 that's safe money. Yeah, I I don't see what that yeah. does for you. I really yeah, don't see what that does for you at all. Okay. Uh, uh, I I and and by the way, how are you paying this guy? Well, I pay half percent. Half a percent on five yeah. million. It's not bad. I feel like you could do better. You okay. like him? Like, what's what now? Are you yeah. are you freaked out now because he told you to do this? Yeah, because I'm one of these people that as soon as you talk to me about annuities, I don't think you're with me. Yeah, I think you're. I think you're just with yourself. Yeah. So, like I told him, I said every time I listen to someone that's neutral mm-hmm. that doesn't want my business, mm. they're totally against annuities. Yeah. But as soon as I walk into the office and wants my business, they tell me whatever they want, mm. and they want you to get an, an annuity. Yeah. Do you want to talk to someone else, or like, what? How are you uh, feeling you know, about it? I feel like I I want to give them a chance. Okay. Yeah, I'm not too desperate. All right. So yeah, I, so I then I think that it, if at, I mean, first of all, at a half a percent, I think that that's fine. You know, that's a decent number. I think that. He's going to have to make up for the annuity call. You 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 were really smart just to sort of have like flashing yellow light warning. And now I'd be interested to hear what he has to say. So you may maybe what you can say to him is, hey, you know, I did a little back of the envelope calculation. And it looks to me that like if I were to just have instead of four buckets, have three buckets, essentially. I, I guess that he's wondering is he saying that you're going to live off the money until your full retirement age and then claim Social Security? And is that a bucket, potentially? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I think that there's – I think that if you had four buckets and you had some of the money that is uh, – I'm just going to be, instead of having his risk levels, I, I would say pre – I do it more like pre-Social Security retirement age, which I guess is 66 or 67 for you. 
So then I would have my post social security to death. Just figure out when you're going to die. Let him know. And then the rest of the money. <laughs> that's a joke, man. And then the rest of the money for the kids and the grandkids. But that I have a sense that that's the, that you're going to need the three million in, for you. And he can divide up those buckets, make that conservative number really, really conservative for the pre-Social Security. The moderate is the post-Social Security and the rest for the kids and, and the grandkids. And if perhaps... If he thinks this and make him do a little work, hey, you know what? Am I going to be in a different tax bracket than my kids? So here's a question. You know, is does it make sense for me to actually take some of the money out of these retirement accounts, pay the tax that's due and then gift it to the kids? Should I be doing that or just thinking about that? And I'm going to make sure that you remind him, like, hey, get me a trust and estate attorney because I got to do that. Okay. But I think you're in really good shape, and I agree with your analysis, which is, hey, I don't need to be tying up my money. Liquidity is really the, the key to your retirement. You've, got, you've done all the hard work. Let's not tie up even three or 400 grand in an annuity. There's no need to. You're going to okay. have your own annuity. It's going to be like John's annuity. And it is going to be a lot cheaper than using an insurance company. Sounds good. All right, man. Good luck. Thank you so much for calling. And congratulations. Well done. 59 years old. Five million bucks. All right. Well, thanks for taking the time. You too. Take care, man. Bye-bye. Have a great day. You bet. Yeah. I think sometimes an annuity is really interesting. Like a fixed annuity is an interesting idea or an immediate annuity. Look, a lot of people who have tons and tons of money, they might say, hey, I want to put a, let's just say that John had $10 million. Let me put a million dollars into an immediate annuity, a low cost one. He puts it in and he creates income from now until his social security claiming, right? Till that full retirement age, let's say it's 67. So he says, I'm going to put this money in right now, turn the spigot on. And for eight years, I have the money and it comes out. That may be a perfect idea, but I think that considering what his goals are, I'm not sure why putting 300 grand in a fixed annuity makes a ton of sense. I mean, one thing that uh, he wrote to me before we got him on the air, and he said the fixed annuity was at three and a half percent. I mean, treasuries are at 10, 10 year treasuries at three percent, and I don't have to tie my money up. That's my those are my thoughts. It's hard. I'm I going to tell you something. I'm going to make a prediction. Mark, mark my words. I don't think he's going to last with this guy because I think this is going to be completely weird that he's going to go back to the guy who's supposed to like. And now he also has this strange moment where he is going to everything the guy now says. Now, John's going to be like, "Eh, I don't know. Was he is he really in my best interest or not? Yeah, I think the trust is kind of singed. It's a problem. Anyway, we'll see. We'll stay in touch with him. All right. If you've got a financial question, you don't need five million bucks. You could have five bucks and we'll still be very happy to chat with you. Send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Hey, go to our website, JillOnMoney.com. You want to sign up for our free weekly newsletter. There are going to be some pretty amazing things that happen with that newsletter. Just wait. It's going to be fabulous. All right. Jill on Money. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger takes the mystery out of your finances. You know, the only way I can take the mystery out of your specific finances is if you contact us. Yeah. Just uh, send an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. And if you have follow-up questions, I love that too. So... Um, we're, we have a few of you who are following up with questions. We're going to get through those and just want to blast through as much as we possibly can. Um, this is a recidivist questioner who, uh, is from Charlotte, North Carolina. 
My wife and four sisters transferred their mother's house into their names. My wife and four sisters transferred their mother's house into their own names years ago. At that time, the house was worth $800,000. They're in the process of selling it with a buyer at about $1.3 million. My question, since it's been owned for more than 18 months and she does not have any residency to claim, would she just claim her portion as long-term capital gains on income tax at the end of the year? And then he tells me how they would readjust the split. Um, so when you gift a house into the name, you you gift in the cost basis as well. So um, the problem that you have is that you transferred your mother's house, her mother's house. Was her mother alive or not? That's the question. I don't know that. Let's say that mom was dead. And they inherited the house. Um, and then they split it out into all their names. And they held it and then sold it. Then if you inherit the house at that time, it was $800,000. They each get that as their cost basis. And they would adjust their cost basis accordingly. Um, but if you're telling me that the five kids transferred mom's house into their name years ago while your mother was still alive, then guess what? They get the cost basis that mom had. So it wouldn't be at that time the house was worth 800 It would be, let's say the house was worth 100 when mom first bought it. That's your cost basis. So this is something that is incredibly important that you deal with. And I think that you're going to have to talk to a, a real estate attorney or um, and also maybe a CPA to to walk through this again. The if you're listening, when someone puts your a house in your name and that person is still alive, you get the grantor's cost basis. And that's why it's very dangerous. So. Let's go. I, I need a little bit more information, but I, I'm a little worried the way you asked that. Just saying. Uh, okay. This question is from Dave, who says, what's your opinion of asset-based long-term care insurance as an alternative to traditional long-term care insurance? Um, I'm almost 64. I've been, I've been working as my own financial planner. I'm comfortable with my investments and income plan, with the exception of long-term care. We're average to above average in health. We have no children to fall back on. Partial self-insurance is an option, but I would like to have a supplemental plan to offset potential future expenses. You know, there's traditional long-term care insurance, which you should probably investigate, even though it's expensive. Um, and then there are these hybrid products, which are essentially insurance contracts, like some sort of permanent life insurance with a long-term care rider, as well as an annuity product. But- I, um, without knowing your actual total net worth, I can't determine whether or not you really need long-term care insurance, but I would investigate those options. Um, I personally still like plain old long-term care insurance if you can qualify, but yeah, I mean, you just have to know that these are really expensive, you know, and long-term care is expensive. Hybrids are also expensive. Um, they may be more favorable than getting a separate long-term care policy, but it really depends on you and the amount of coverage you need. And there is very, you know, I, I do like flexibility, so I think that that's great. Um, but I think it's really important to get lots of different providers and be careful because these things are very very expensive. Okay. I hope that helps. Ah, I think I got to write a new long-term care column, Mark. I got to do one of those, an update. That would be good. Uh, yeah, I got you. He's telling me that I have two minutes left. Um, okay. Jim wants to know what, uh, his, what I think of his financial situation. Uh, he's 14 years into a job that offers decent pension at retirement. At 20 years, I would be eligible for lifetime medical. I can retire and start drawing down my pension when I'm 51. I'm 42 right now. I'm thinking about a job change. and was wondering if I should stick out the last nine years for the pension or attempt to look elsewhere for a better working environment. Mm. 
I got to tell you something. I would, if you don't hate your job and you have a kind and you have a, a solid pension with lifetime medical, Mark, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of signing up for that. I, I, I'd have to know. Are you miserable? Is it a horrible job? Is it an, I mean, you already have 14, you already have 14 years in. So, I don't know. I'm kind of hoping you stick it out. But if you need more information, give us a holler. Um, Last, uh, here is a a question. The subject is, where is the inflation? Why? So basically, why is there no inflation? Well, guess what? There's starting to be a little inflation. So now you can answer that. When you have a financial crisis that is uh, basically what's called a balance sheet recession, meaning there's a lot of debt overhang, too much borrowing, Uh, too much easy lending. When you come out of those kinds of crises, they tend to be deflationary. And that's what we have just actually gone through. So there's just starting to be a little bit of inflation percolating into the universe. Got a uh, recent PPI and CPI report that showed kind of highest levels in about six years. And, you know, even if you take out food and energy, prices are rising, wages are rising, inflation's percolating. And um, as a matter of fact, I was just saying to Mark, I think the Federal Reserve may have to go faster than is currently anticipated. All right. That's a great segment. Lots of emails. If you want us to know more about your financial situation, send us a note. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast, our sister show. It's called Better Off. You can get it on Apple, Stitcher, Radio.com, Google Play, anywhere else you find your favorite podcasts. But this is Jill on Money, and we will be right back. Have a finance question? There are many ways to reach the show. You can call anytime at 855-411-JILL, send an email to askjill at jillonmoney.com, or tweet a question on Twitter using the handle at jillonmoney. Just use the hashtag AskJill. You are back with Jill on Money, and if you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Send us lots of information. Let me actually just read an email that is the perfect email in terms of getting a great response because it's replete with tons of information. It's from Mark. Subject, want to retire ASAP, what to do? And then he just goes in and starts listing his assets. 750 grand in TIAA CREF, and he gives me the breakdown. 100 grand in a Charles Schwab brokerage account. ETFs. Let's see. Oh, I see. He's got the, he gives me the breakdown of the Schwab brokerage account. 13 grand in a traditional IRA, 19 grand in uh, vested stock, um, 33,000 bucks in cash. Earnings, 81 grand a year. Single, 20 years left on a current mortgage, about 1,200 bucks a month. No credit card, no debt. No credit card debt or loans. Will need a car in the near future. I no longer work in nonprofit. I cannot contribute to the TIAA. I could roll it over. Uh, Lackluster performance in 2017 in Schwab. Fidelity 401k, best returns. And then he tells me what he's been earning for each, you know, for the past year, which is irrelevant. So don't even worry about that. How soon can I semi-retire? Considering I earn somewhere between seventeen and twenty four thousand dollars a year until age sixty six. He's sixty two now. He's gonna get a twenty twenty one hundred no, it's okay, so here we go. Social security. Let's forget about pay he's sixty two. We're not going early retirement. So you're gonna do at sixty six and two months. 2700 bucks at age 70 3500 bucks. So it looks to me like you have 750 850 you've got about 900 grand. Um and you're going to have 
you need he's gonna he will work and make let's call it eighteen thousand a year. He doesn't really tell me how much he needs to live on. What do you think, Mark? What are we gonna make? His he's got eighty he he has an eighty thousand dollars salary now. What do you think we should assume he's living on? Fifty or sixty? All right, let's Mark's saying sixty five. I'm gonna say sixty grand. So he needs five thousand a month. He's gonna have he said he'll make, let's say, hmm, twelve hundred a month right now. But let's say when he retires. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, here's what I think. I think he's probably okay. Cause he's gonna have about thirty grand from his investments. Maybe more. I'm just gonna be really conservative here. So I mean, if you think about this, you're going to have 30 grand from your investments if you and I'm doing this till your age. So you work for four or five more years and uh, you got your Social Security is another 30. I think you're kind of done. I think this is it. I don't think you should semi retire. I think you should keep working unless you're miserable. Um, you could semi-retire and you could have that $2,100 a month in Social Security, but it stinks to have that be a permanently reduced benefit. Um, so I would really try to keep working till your full retirement age of 66 in two months. I think that's where it's going to look good. Um, and it's only a few years away. If you're miserable and you want to do and you want to work part time, maybe you could do it in a couple of years. You need a couple of years of growth, though. You really do. Don't be moving all your stuff around. Don't be taking on more risk. Looks to, you know, he looks like about a 60-40 kind of investor. Um, don't worry about something earning whatever it earned last year. It doesn't matter. It's a long game. Um, and if you're working with an advisor who's not helping you out, get a new advisor. Mm. So I think you're going to have to keep working a little bit. Joy has been listening to our program, and uh, she's 71. She lives on Social Security, 800 bucks a month. I'm selling a piece of property for $10,500. I want to know the best way to invest it. I have no idea where to start. Uh, you know, if you're living on 800 bucks a month and you have no other money, I would pop that sucker right in the bank, miss. I wouldn't start investing at age 71. So that I think you got to be really conservative. And you, it's always good to have a little liquidity. Don't forget, having a little extra money around, very good. Uh, let's see if I can get one more in. Maurizio, 32-year-old, full-time legal assistant, got debt, $55,000. Ay vey. Purchased a home four years ago. He's got equity of around 120000 would it be smart move to refinance it, lock in the profit at these rates before they keep going up and pay off the rest of my debt? Which is, yeah, yeah, definitely. Go ahead. Go crazy. Absolutely, positively. Try to refi, hit that debt, get rid of it, and you're done. Do all your homework. There's probably fees involved for doing this. Be careful. By the way, someone just said we had an excellent employment report. Why wasn't it mentioned in the Tribune on Saturday or Sunday? I don't know. That's their problem. (laughs) I didn't. I have no. I have nothing to do with it. Talk to their editors. I have to submit my columns well in advance, so I'm not a news peg kind of gal for those columns. Okay. You're listening to Jill on Money. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. You're back with Jill on Money. And if you've got a financial question, it could be about anything. It could be about investing. It could be about uh, your retirement, your college. You're just starting out listening to us. Need some help just kind of getting a plan together. Need some financial advice. Need to know whether your financial advisor has your best interest putting you first. Give us a holler. Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. Uh, Sharon wants to know uh, about 
uh, some information for her unmarried child. He's in his early 30s. Um, you know, I think she wants an, a, a, an easy form that's not a full-blown will about what to do if something happened to him. And here's the deal. He needs a will. You're an adult. you got assets. You can absolutely do that. Just draft. He should draft a will. doesn't matter whether he's married or not. If he doesn't want to draft a will, then he could potentially just make you or nieces or nephews the beneficiary of any uh, any asset that's passed by contract. That would be like a 401k, an IRA, a life insurance policy. And he could conceivably also have uh, TOD accounts, transfer on death accounts. But still, wouldn't he want to have a power of attorney or a health care proxy? I think he probably needs a will. Sharon, tell the kid to go to a lawyer and get a will. OK. Um, here's from Christine, who's living on a very tight budget. She is a retired nurse. She's 75 years old. She says, oh, I love your show. I should have listened in my 20s. Well, considering that you're 75, please note that I did not do a show. Um, she's got a house that's worth 220 grand. She owes 50,000. She's got a small pension, her social security check. She wants to know whether she should consider a, a reverse mortgage. Um, hmm. I don't think you've got enough equity in this that's going to give you enough money. So I'm, I'm going to say probably not, Christine. Um, I don't have a great answer for you, but I doubt that you're going to be able to yeah, you know, you can check it out, price it out, and but don't do anything until you give us a holler back and tell us what you find out. Okay? How about that? You are listening to Jill on Money, and when we return, we're going to do our interview. And, of course, weave in some more of your questions. It's Jill on Money, and we will be right back. It's the weekend, and that can only mean one thing. You're listening to Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome to Jill on Money. Through the miracle of technology, I am currently on vacation. <laughs> That's right. But don't worry. Mark is closely monitoring the inbox and he is making sure that we are collecting all of your messages and he is arranging to get you on the air which is fantastic so if you have a financial question don't worry just send us an email ask jill at jillonmoney.com ask jill at jillonmoney.com. Uh, so for this vacation, I'm trying to do something really wild, which is I'm trying to disconnect. So no social media is what I'm trying. And checking email once a day, just one time. You know what I'm thinking as I record this before my vacation? Uh, maybe, Mark, I shouldn't actually have my phone with me then I can't take pictures of the dogs. But if one of us has our phone, that's all that's needed. Anyway, that's my my goal is to have a, a break from everything and to uh, come back psyched up to be here. And I'm psyched up to be here right now because we've got a great guest this hour. His name is Ron Lieber. He describes himself as husband, dad, New York Times money columnist. He's also an author, the opposite of spoiled, Raising kids who are grounded, generous, and smart about money. Today, we're talking to him about a lot of his research into the Equifax crazy deal. So right now, here is our interview with Ron Lieber. 
So what's your what's your background? Like you come from a journalism education or did you how did you get into this? I come from a liberal arts background. Uh, I was an American studies major interdisciplinary at Amherst College. Uh, the best that I can say for my uh, so-called financial training was the C plus I got in economics 11. I have never worked so hard at something and done so miserably. I think maybe part of the reason I grew up to be reasonably good at personal finance was that I had a lot of trouble myself back in the day understanding some core concepts of economics. And one of the things that I take seriously is my obligation to explain things in simple terms, in plain English, uh, but not in a way that is dumbed down. Down. And that is what I love about you. It's why I feel like we are kindred spirits. I consider me your much older cousin. I doubt you're that uh, much older. A little bit older. Um, because I do love that. I love your column. When I initially started stalking slash contacting you, it was um, in the midst of the Equifax craziness. And you were so on top of that story. I wonder if we could just kind of roll back a little bit, not just to last year, but in your mind, as you start writing the the Your Money column, that's a huge story. You have to cover it. How do you decide what to write about? Are you, are you taking input from your readers, or is it just what you find interesting, or the screw-ups in your own financial life? What, how do you pick your, your, your topics? It was actually completely insane what happened behind the scenes there. So let me take you back years, right? Because we personal finance geeks had actually been preparing for this moment mentally for a long time. We figured that there was a pretty good chance that one day the big one was going to happen, right? There was going to be a breach at one of the big three credit bureaus. So we knew that that was going to be a moment. We weren't sure when it was going to happen or how, but we figured it was coming. So flash forward to that day in September. I've just given a speech in Chicago. I've got a fly down to Florida on one of the very last flights going down there to evacuate my father out of the hurricane's path because he's handicapped uh, and in a wheelchair, right? So my flight cancels, and then five minutes later, as I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to get from Chicago to Orlando, the Equifax story breaks. And our four best reporters are scattered in four different places, including one outside of the United States, and the editor is in a fifth place, and we've got a figure out and confirm that this is the big one very quickly and then put together a front page 2,500 word story in the space of 90 minutes. Oh, my God. (laughs) So that's how it started. (laughs) Um, So we managed to get that done. I go out for a run along the Chicago River. I go out with my friends uh, from back home in Chicago where I grew up. Next morning, I'm up at 4 a.m., managed to catch a 6 a.m. down to Orlando. I'm on the flight. I start reading everybody else's coverage, and it's clear to me that this is really even bigger than we thought, right? Mm -hmm. And I've got to give people a much better sense of what they ought to do. Uh, So, you know, from minute 42 until we hit the ground in Orlando, I'm frantically writing a column, right? Just giving people the basics on credit freezes, why that's always been an appropriate defense mechanism, why it's a particularly good idea now. Uh, And so we get that story up, you know, by the end of the morning. Uh, But then what starts to happen, what becomes clear very quickly is that Equifax's systems from the credit freezes to the efforts that they had made to give consumers some ability to see if they had been affected, all of those systems are melting down completely. They were subpar in the first place, and the their servers, their websites, um, their phone banks cannot handle the load, and everybody is freaking out. And so who is watching out that this does not happen again? Good things in the world of consumer protection in general start with the states um, and and not with the federal government. In general, it hasn't always been the case, especially with the last couple of years under the CFPB, but usually stuff starts trickling out of the West Coast, um, the state legislatures out there, which tend to be more, more liberal, more democratic, um, and they sort of spread over the country. Um, think about credit freezes, right? Credit freezes would not have existed were it not for a couple of state legislatures that sort of got the ball rolling. And then over the course of a decade, they spread slowly but surely, despite intense fighting in all of these state capitals uh, by lobbyists for the credit bureau, the credit reporting agencies, um, you know, state by state, uh, the ability to put a freeze on your credit became a reality such that the big three credit bureaus eventually had to just offer it up to everybody because otherwise it was going to be too much of an administrative hassle. So if we expect some relief in the wake of this particular breach, it's probably going to come from the states. And the question is, what might that be, right? So um, 
maybe credit freezes should be free everywhere for everyone all the time, which they are not now. Uh, maybe the default should be that your credit is always frozen. That's how I want it to be. I right? keep saying to every single advocate, like, we need to agitate that you start at birth, you get a social security number, and immediately your credit is frozen. If you wish to actually get credit, you must unfreeze it, which is also building more responsibility around the process of assuming debt anyway. I like that responsibility angle, right? This is something um, that you have to take an active role in managing whether you like it or not. It's part of being a responsible financial grown-up. So could a state uh, attempt to pass legislation and succeed in doing so without violating some federal law or regulation somewhere along the way that forces the credit bureaus to lock everybody's credit all at once for residents of that state? It would be really interesting to watch somebody try. I, hope I that would love happens. that. I would think we could just do it easily, like on a state income tax return. Okay, when we return, more of our interview with Ron Lieber. If during the break you want to do something fun, hop on to ronlieber.com. That's his website. You can see all the stuff that's going on there. And you can also go to our website, jillonmoney.com. While you're there, sign up for our free weekly newsletter. We'll be right back. Wondering how to make your money work for you? Get on the line now, 855-411-JILL. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back with Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we really would love to hear from you. It'd be so much fun. Uh, you just do one thing. You, you send us an email. Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. That's it. Easy. Uh, Okay, so we are uh, just going to finish up our interview with Ron Lieber. And remember, Ron Lieber, you probably read his columns for a while. He uh, writes a column for the New York Times, the Your Money column. Let's talk a little bit about the F word. That's always a fun thing to talk about with people who cover financial stuff, personal finance. What is fiduciary? why it's important. This is the part of the interview where, you know, we're basically preaching to the choir because you guys know this. You already know how important it is to be working with someone who's putting you ahead of his or her or the company's interest. That's why fiduciary is so important. So here's the rest of our interview with Ron Lieber. Let us talk about one of my very favorite topics, which is fiduciary standard and the thwarted effort by the Department of Labor to create a fiduciary standard where the best interest of a retirement investor must come first. Were you surprised by the the intensity of the pushback on fiduciary? No, I wasn't surprised at all. This has been going on for however long, you know, nearly a decade or maybe more at this point. And the fact of the matter is, is that there are whole lines of business in the financial services industry that would not exist but for the ability to defy being a fiduciary. Here's what I hope, um, and, you know, and the reason we spent a, a lot of time in 2016 and 2017 in the New York Times, mostly Tara Siegel Bernard, my my colleague there, hammering away on these fiduciary stories, is that we want to train readers, listeners, the general public, uh, any time they go in to have a conversation with anyone about anything related to their financial well-being, that the very first question out of their mouth with uh, that stranger or the person who's trying to sell them something is, are you acting in my best interest here? Do you agree to serve as a fiduciary? And if the answer is no, or if the answer is hemming or hawing, or if the answer is longer than one word, 
then you take a walk. I love right? that. And then we have our own personal fiduciary standards, and we don't need to worry about what the government does, right? Because, yeah. you know, the thing that's so baffling about this, right, um, and that I've never been able to get a good answer to when I ask the folks in insurance, um, you know, who are fighting against this, why would anyone want to make a living where you're refusing to act in people's best interests and refusing to, to declare that? Who, who, who wants that? All right. Uh, let's talk about your other passion project, which is What to Pay for College, which is a book that you're writing. Let's talk a little. We get questions all the time. In fact, right before you came here, we had a caller who had $100,000 of student loan debt. And I just had pulled up a Brookings paper about the amount of debt that these jumbo um, loans. It was sort of crazy basically had gone from like these jumbo loans, more than $50,000 of debt went from 2% of these loans to 17% of these loans within, let's call it 20 years-ish. So let me start by saying that I'm a little bit less worried about the size of the debt per person than I was five to 10 years ago. Um, There are also jumbo loans that are being taken out by parents. I worry about those people. Often they are taking those loans out when they are 48, 54, 58. Uh, Maybe their retirement savings are themselves not up to snuff, and yet they are going to be sacrificing contributions to their retirement savings and their retirement livelihoods over the decades after they take these parent loans out. Um, So I worry some about them. The students themselves, the undergraduates, uh, many people were getting into six figures of debt prior to the financial crisis, Um, but one of the things that's changed since then is that you can no longer get a private student loan as an undergraduate, right? The federal loans, you max out are roughly 30 grand. Um, People who want more debt than that as an undergraduate have to go to the private loan market. It used to be before 2008, you could do that without a cosigner. Mm. Now you have to have one. So some grown-up has to show up on the scene and sign off to you taking on more than $30,000 or so of undergraduate debt. So I think there's going to be a little bit less of that, at least among the teenagers, Mm. um, going forward. But the thing that I started to think about after writing for years about how to save for college and the ins and outs of 529 plans, and we mostly understand how those work now, um, or how to pay for college, right? How much debt is too much and the various repayment schemes and how all those work. Spilled a lot of ink over that. But what I realized that I was missing and that we all weren't talking about in an aggressive fashion was the question of what to pay for college, because what had happened while everybody was busy worrying about student loans and, and 529 plans is that on average, the flagship state university, the rack rate at that school, crossed the $100,000 mark, undiscounted, four years, room and board in state, a hundred grand. Mm. Uh, Rutgers, $135,000 for four years. And now. you're for in, in, state. in state. And that's in insanity. State, right? Um, the, so what does that kid do? So let's just right? talk about that. Well, so so that kid is sort of facing that down, right? But maybe that kid has ambitions. They have stars in their eyes. They are uh, a really good student. They have the ability to get into a selective college, maybe even an Ivy League college, right? Those colleges are now $300,000 for four years if you do not get a discount, right? So, and I use that word discount quite uh, specifically and purposefully because back when you and I were going to college, uh, the financial aid you got was based entirely on the basis of financial need, how much money your family had and could afford to pay. There's this whole new system running along a separate rail now um, called merit aid, right, which are discounts according to essentially how good of a student you are and how much you can sort of burnish and buff the brand of the institution that may be willing to accept you, right? So you got $100,000 over here at the state university. You've got $300,000 at the most selective colleges. You've got all sorts of discounting going on for two different reasons behind the scenes. And you've got to make a decision as a family with a teenager who is the apple of your eye, right? How much more am I going to spend? How much more am I willing to spend? 
to reach for this more selective private institution, this out-of-state public university that might cost two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand dollars $250,000? When and under what circumstances does it make sense to pay more, and how exactly am I going to measure value here? And it turns out that when you go looking for data in our supposedly data-rich world in 2018 to sort all of this out the way that you would for your car on Consumer Reports or your house on Zillow, you will find basically nothing. This is the biggest financial decision your family will ever make, and we are all making these decisions in the absence of data. And the colleges actually like it that way. Yeah, it's so opaque. It's ridiculous, right? On the most basic of levels, when you go to a college's website to try and figure out how they discount for merit aid, there is no standard for explanation, disclosure. It is all over the map. Much of it is totally and utterly opaque. Uh, you may have no or very little idea of you know whether your kid um, can qualify. And that's in senior year, right? But again, this is one of the biggest financial decisions you will ever make. You've got to plan for it years, decades ahead of time. You have no idea whether your three-year-old is going to qualify for merit aid based on their SAT score. And yet you still have to plan financially for this crazy six-figure expense per child each time, right? So just walking through the front door, it's completely obscure. Then maybe you get in, you get some financial aid offers. But yes, as you say, all of these terms are different. It's impossible to compare them. Some of it's negotiable. It's never clear when or how. Um, it is way more complicated than it should be. The system is a disgrace, and I intend to make it clear to people. Well, thanks so much to Ron Lieber. We'll link to his stuff. Questions, concerns, issues? Send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. And during the break, why don't you go to JillOnMoney.com. You can read, listen, watch, and sign up for our newsletter. It's free. All right, we'll be right back. If you've missed any part of the show or want to check out a past show, go to JillOnMoney.com for more great personal finance content. You're back with Jill on Money. Hey, Mark, you know what we got to put on the website? Got to put the Gracie Award up. Yes! Hey, we won a big award in May. I flew out to California. Mark would not come with me. He refused. He said it was because he had class. But I think he just didn't want to be my date. No. Well, yeah, I think it was I think it was also you didn't really want to go, did you? Do you own a tuxedo? Yeah. Well, the person who took me does own a tuxedo. Well, that was his third. He has three. Anyway, Mark's gonna put some pictures up. Maybe I can get I think that maybe the maybe we'll have to put the picture up. I think that has to go on the front door and make that the picture that goes all the way across, don't you? Well, you're gonna have to try. Anyway, uh, if you've got a financial question, do contact us, okay? Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. So easy. And that is what Pete did. Pete uh, reads uh, the articles I write in the Tampa Bay Times, and uh, he has a question about Social Security. Specifically, what is your viewpoint about the optimum age to start taking Social Security? I'm soon to be 64. I'm in good health. I've got a good pension. I've got investments and a net worth which has allowed me to live on an income of about 60% of my latest working salary. Wow. My wife has her own assets, a government pension. So my question regards to just my financial situation. I should note that while 60% of my salary seems a bit low, at the time of my retirement, I was a senior executive. I was making good money, saving way more than I was spending. So 60% allows me to enjoy retirement so far. My Social Security question is a tough one, as I hear opinions saying, wait until at least 66, and then some say, wait until 70. And while my health is a good in one way, I hate to wait till 70 because... Uh, you know, I could spend it or investment. Is there a magic formula for deciding when to take Social Security? And do you have any resources you recommend for studying and understanding Social Security? Absolutely. In fact, on the resource tab of JillOnMoney.com, 
you can scroll down and you see a couple of things. One is the Social Security website, which allows you to manage your account online. So ssa.gov slash my account. Then we also have a link, a separate link that goes to the estimator, the Social Security estimator at ssa.gov. That will allow you to actually figure out what the difference is between waiting a year or waiting four or five years. I also want to point out that I've got a new link down at the bottom called esplanner.com, esplanner.com. And the reason I want you to maybe take a look at that is uh, that could help you probably with a lot of other questions. Um, I think that one of the things that is important in your question is sort of an embedded question that we all want to know, which is how can we approach social, Social Security? How can we approach retirement and maximize what we can get? But we also are juggling the idea that we're getting older. And when you think about that, you say, "Uh uh-oh, I don't want to be the dum-dum who took Social Security, was waiting to take Social Security at 70 and dropped out at 69. So in general, the rule of thumb around Social Security that I always think about is, yes, you want to wait till your full retirement age because that is usually going to be kind of your your good bogey. It also gives your spouse some a flexibility. Now, you say we're kind of making this decision outside of your spouse because your wife kind of has her own assets and her government pension. So I am going to take that aside. But for everyone listening, maximizing your Social Security is not just a, a question or a bet on your life. Because if you were to die and your spouse is planning to take one half of your Social Security benefits when you take it before your full retirement age, the benefit is permanently reduced. So what happens when you wait till 70? You get a larger benefit. And usually the, the, the break even is that if you live until about age 82, maybe 83 now, but 82, I believe, is the last break off then you will have been better off waiting to claim your Social Security. If you really think, I don't want to roll the dice about 82, and if you really want the money, even though you say you don't need it, then wait until your full retirement age and go get the Social Security at that point, and I think you'll be fine. I do think that you you may want to start playing around with some of these calculators it can be a, a, a real help to understand what the pros and cons are and also how this would actually play into your overall financial game plan. So um, that's what I'm telling you to do. So check out that ES planner. I think that's an interesting one. Um, and, you know, I, you're not going to make a mistake. You know, you're just not. It's, it's much better for you to try and maximize your Social Security. If you don't, if you don't feel comfortable with that, then do it at your full retirement age. It's all going to be well. I, I mean, you're really in good shape, so I, you're not going to make a mistake, and it's not going to be 100% win either way because so much of this is based on life expectancy. And, you know, our old joke in financial planning, tell me when you're going to die and I can create the best retirement plan for you. Mark says, if you don't need it, why not wait? Because I don't want him also then to have like terrible, bitter. I mean, the other the other side of it is I, I don't really need it. I don't have to wait. I could take it at 66 or 65, whenever his full retirement age is. But you got to do it that, you know, in a way that feels comfortable to you and that you're not going to have any bitterness. So you're not going to win 100 percent. You're rolling the dice a little bit. It's based on your life expectancy. So that is the piece that is is just hard to guess. It sounds like you're in good shape. I'd probably wait, but, you know, you'll figure it out. Okay. <sighs> Love those questions. Go to JillOnMoney.com because that's where the whole resource center is. There's lots of stuff on there. It's not just about retirement or Social Security. We actually have a life expectancy calculator, one of my favorites. You know, it's all good stuff. When we return, we are going to get 
to you, your questions, and we'll see if we can help you out. Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. Follow Jill on Twitter and Instagram for more personal finance content. Just use the handle at Jill on Money. Now, back to the show. You're back with Jill on Money. Hey, Mark, how's my Instagram account doing? People like that? I mean, how do you know? How do you get feedback on that? You just get followers? Who cares about me? Oh, Mark does. Maybe you guys do, too. Are you Instagrammers? I don't not really. Anyway. Uh, okay. Let's get to some questions here. This is Jill on Money. I am Jill Schlesinger. I am a nerd. I am a CBS News business analyst. I am a CFP, Certified Financial Planner. And I'm here to answer your questions. So if you have a financial question, we want to get on the air with you. But if you're shy, you can always send us an email. And the email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. That's what Lee did, uh, who says, in 2018, I will not be able to contribute to a Roth IRA because my combined income, pension, wages, business income, will throw me over the allowable threshold to make a Roth IRA contribution. My employer offers a Roth TSP, a thrift savings plan. However, in order to minimize my tax liability, I only contribute to a traditional TSP. I wonder if you think I should contribute to a traditional Roth IRA for 5500 instead of maxing out my traditional TSP. He's head of household, or she's head of household. Uh, okay. I think that taxes are at very low levels right now. And I think that if you're really concerned about um, your your current tax liability, you may want to go back to where you really stand. You may want to go back and check out the new brackets because, you know, I understand you're making more than your the the allowable limit for a Roth. So uh, the Roth allowable limit for head of household is, uh, you must be making more than $135,000. So if that's the case and you're head of household, um, maybe you actually are in a lower tax bracket than you really understand. Um, and uh, I, I, I would encourage you, if you have a Roth TSP option, to just use it. Because, you know, one clue about how good a Roth structure is, is the fact that when people make too much money, they can't use it. And therefore, what I would suggest is put in $18,500 into your Roth TSP and don't worry about the tax deduction because this is valuable and tax brackets are low right now. You know, our guest, Ed Slot, he's an IRA expert. He's a CPA he is so gung-ho. He said, please, every single person who calls, writes, asks about this, when possible, tell them to use an employer-sponsored Roth structure, especially people who make too much money for a regular Roth. And don't sweat your deduction. Now, there's a separate question here about retirement plan for business. Now, this is where things can get very interesting. Because if you have a business, uh, which uh, in, in the description, Lee says, my business is seasonal. I employ three employees uh, full time for three months out of the year on an annual basis. In that case, I might consider uh, putting in place something called a simple IRA. I don't know how much money you make, but simple IRAs allow you to put a plan in place and put in $12,500 a year pre-tax, three grand if you're over the age of 50. But it's a very easy plan when you have some employees. As opposed to putting in a 401k, you'd have to actually have, it's, it's a more complicated plan. 
So I would check out a simple IRA. That might be your best bet. I think it'll probably get you where you want to go. If you have more questions or you want to follow up, please don't hesitate. But more importantly, this may lead to other questions of things going on in your financial life. And of course, that to me is the most fabulous part of getting some advice on an ongoing basis is that things change or it might spur other questions. We are here for for, for you. We actually have a many people who follow up with us. Someone sent us her gravestone, her cemetery plot. That's what she, she showed, right? Isn't that what she shared with us? Her head. How do you get a headstone before you die? That's got to be like a little bit spooky. I know people buy cemetery plots. But a headstone? I don't know. You know what we put on my father's headstone, Mark? You're going to like this. He's guessing. Hold on. Thinking. Ah, the man was never boring. And so true. Just celebrated what would have been my father's birthday. So that's sad. I hate to be a downer, but uh, I very I, I have a mixed feeling about cemeteries. They do kind of creep me out. But now that actually someone so close to me has died, it's not bad to have a physical place to go say hello. Hi. Your, Mark's getting cremated. My father got cremated, but they pop, popped him right in the ground with the urn. He had a very cool urn. Black leather. Nice, huh? Very Alby. All right. You don't need to talk about this on the air, Jill, really. Okay, you are listening to Jill on Money. And uh, if you've got a retirement question, uh, just know that we, we also have a ton of retirement resources on our website, jillonmoney.com. All you have to do is go to under resources, and you will find tons of stuff there. So it's pretty great. All right, if you've got a question, shoot us an email. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. We will be right back. You're back with Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. So easy. Just send us a quick email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. If you cannot remember that, what you can do is you can just go to the website, JillOnMoney.com, and click Contact Us. Gina writes, her subject is HELOC, Home Equity Line of Credit. With a current increase in interest rates and the projection of more increases this year, would you advise converting my variable rate home equity line of credit into a fixed rate equity loan? Well, Gina, you know what? I probably would. Uh, Some of this is uh, predicated on the outstanding loan balance and also whether there's a first on the property, because it may be that... uh, it doesn't make sense to do it because it's too expensive. It may also be that if you rolled everything together and started a new loan, that might be better. But you've got—I think you got to talk to, talk to somebody to get the pricing, and then we want to hear from you. So make sure that you um, give us that information, just so we have that for you. Uh, okay. So let's see. Um, this is from Mary, who's 62 years old. Um, she says, can I count on Social Security being there for me long term? Mary from Arizona, I'm happy to say, yes, you can. Social Security um, is, a, is a problem that's easily solved. It's actually a math problem. And you don't have to worry. It will be there. And by the way, I would almost say that about anyone who's 55 and older, maybe even 50 and older. At this point, there is not a lot of indication that all of a sudden Social Security is going bust. The problem is that for the future, the amount of money that's already in the system, the number of workers versus the people who are retiring, there's only enough money to pay out three quarters of benefits. I think they're going to fix that because, you know what, old people like us, we vote. 
All right, that's it. That's the show. Thank you so much for listening. If you have a question throughout the week, don't forget, just go to the website, jillonmoney.com. We've got a contact button there. Read all of our content. Tell us what you want to hear. We'd love to have you on. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com is our web is our email address, and we will see you next week. Thank you so much for listening.